So God tells Moses, this is Exodus 32, and the Lord said, I have seen this people, behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now why is God upset? Now you know the story of Moses, leading people for years through the wilderness. God's angry with them because these folks, no matter how much God has done, grumbling, murmuring, worshipping other idols, and don't you think you get upset if one day your child after growing up here, walks off with a non-Christian and starts worshipping idols. Is that okay with you? God was furious. The trouble was these Israelites. It's not that they were not perfect. The real issue was lack of worship. You're worshipping idols in place of the real God. You get the drift now. This is the reason God was upset. Now, quickly, let's read and understand. This is chapter 33, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it, else I'll read for you. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, unto thy seed. Whose seed? Abraham's. No, Moses' seed. God is going to bless Moses' seed. So, here is God angry saying, I am upset. Your folks are stiff-necked. You know, David did a lot of immoral stuff. God never called him stiff-necked. David was far unrighteous than Moses, right? Because the things he did, God never once called David stiff-necked. Why? David said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence come with my help. See, David knew how to repent. Never once did God call David stiff-necked, but he's upset with these people. 
Now, Moses, as you know, found in the river by Pharaoh's daughter. You know that story, right? So for 40 years, he's in the palace. Which means, Moses, you have political connections, you have clout, you learned how to fight. So he's a good soldier, fighter. From there, 40 years later, he goes out, finds an Egyptian bullying a Jew. Moses said, I will not tolerate. Kills a man. Not something you'd like to have on your resume. Killed someone, murderer. So he's a convict. From convict, where does God bring him? Being a shepherd. How does he become a shepherd? You recall the story. He one day is taking a walk. He sees Jethro, his daughters, being harassed by shepherds. So why come you? Why are you harassing them? Stands up and then fights these shepherd boys to protect these young ladies. Nobody asked him to do that. See, the trouble is, how do you deal with bullies? Bullies are everywhere. When I was growing up throughout my school life, I never liked, liked to look back on my school life. I was bullied three hours. First, I have a name like Peacock. I always make jokes. Right? With a surname like Peacock, I always make fun. <laughs> Roshan will find some of it when he goes to college. So I had a name like that. I never performed well in academics. Bullied constantly. I decided this cannot go on. College, I changed everything. By the time I got to college, I got the university prize. So one day the principal writes to me, I was just married. We moved to Pune, finished my studies. Principal writes to me and says, Anand, you won the university prize. You have to come to Chennai to get up. I said, excuse me, sir. That, that is bullying. We have students in Burma, Bangladesh, Bhutan. If they win a college prize, you'll ask them to come all the way. I said, sir, you keep it as my gift to you. In one week, the checker right. See, bullies, no? How do you define a bully? A bully is someone who will inflict to hurt, harm, injure, insult you for no fault of yours. Find it everywhere. Not just church. Everywhere. Place you work, you'll have bullies. Remember David? 20 years he was bullied, not by Goliath. By whom? Saul. Saul. Plain insecure that a guy is better than you. You're making fun of this guy. You're trying to kill him. You remember? Saul throws a spear time and again. So I realized, I am bullied if I am worse than you, I am bullied if I am better than you. So the issue is not really mine, the issue is yours. If you are bullying someone for who they are, you are trying to put them down for no fault of theirs. Insecurity, no? Now may I ask you this question? Many of you have various strengths and gifts. You are better than others. They will bully you for that. Will you stop using those strengths? What do you say? God's given you strength at your place of birth, in your church, in society, on the road. Will you stop using your strengths because someone bullies you? Will you? Come on. No. Why? So if you are better than someone, they will bully you. If you are worse, they will bully you. Wait a minute. My weakness needs your strength just as your weakness needs my strength. You have strengths, I don't have. I have strengths, you don't have. That's how we work. If you are better, be ready, you will be bullied. Now, quickly, Moses, from the palace, that means he's actually high up here, goes down to becoming a convict, a murderer. From there goes even lower to being a shepherd. Do you know shepherds were hated by Egyptians? I'll tell you why. You remember God tells Israel, put the blood of a lamb on your doorpost so the angel of death will not go. You remember that? Now, let me read and show to you. Exodus 12, we're on the same book. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt, strike down every firstborn of people and animals and bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. So I, I am the Lord. This blood will be a sign on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. See, pass over. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So, first reason, the Jews were saved, ours were killed. Why will I like sheep? A lamb is 12 months and younger. A younger sheep is called a lamb. So if something has killed our children and you are looking after that animal, you think I like you? First point. See, point number two. Joseph is introducing his brothers to Pharaoh. Remember, they come back and find, oh, Joseph's in the palace. 
Joseph has to introduce who they are. Look at Joseph's words. Joseph says to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to whom? Pharaoh. And will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who are living in the land of Canaan have come to me. Men are shepherds. See, he's saying their profession to whom? To Pharaoh. Introducing his brothers. They tend livestock and they have brought out their own flocks and herds and everything they own. Wait a minute. If you can own 100, 200 sheep, you are not poor. Don't ever think shepherds in the Old Testament were poor. If you have cattle, Job has thousands, you are by no means poor. Now look at the response. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? What did Joseph say? Their occupation is what? Shepherd. You should answer, your servants have tended livestock from your boyhood, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. I'm sorry, that's cut off from here. Understand? Why do I hate the shepherds? Now think. First, you use that same sheep which killed our children. You're looking after them. Jews also eat lamb. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that will make more sense. The Egyptians worshipped this god. What animal is the head look like? Ram. See, so it's animal of a head of a ram, body of a human being. Look, this is their god called Tum. So Egyptians worship this god. They believe this Kum god created the first man out of his own hands with clay. Do we believe that? We believe God breathed life, right? Genesis. Now, you Jews are killing the very thing we worship. You offer sacrifices in the temple, right? You are killing the same God I worship. I will not tolerate a shepherd. Do you get the logic? First, the sheep, lamb's blood killed our children. Next, you are killing the very lamb that we, a ram is a male sheep. You are killing the very thing that we worship. Why do you think I will tolerate you? So they, they hated shepherds. Look at Moses' transition. Moses, uh, Moses is, gives us a shepherd model throughout the Old Testament, New Testament. You remember it says, I am the good shepherd. What does the shepherd model have? Shepherd model describes the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, which means same as the relationship between Christ and us. Is that clear? Point number two, what is the job of the shepherds? Keep the flock safe, right? Remember, looking after sheep is not kid stuff. They will always be bullies. I told you about bullies. Who is the bully? Bears, lions, wolves will attack your sheep. Your job is what? Protect. Christ protected us from the consequences of sin. Last, sheep are dumb, cannot find their way. They need a shepherd. Is it making sense to you? Please remember, if you lead a flock in church or even outside, people will attack them. Your job is to protect. They will tell something about so and so to something and so and so. Gossip. They will want to create division. Your job is not to spread that gossip, is to protect them. Now, look at Moses' charts. From the palace, he's going down to a murderer. From murderer, he's going down to a shepherd. That is the lowest job. From there, he becomes leader of Israel. Try and follow. Why do you think God took him to that journey? Moses is high up here, palace, convict, shepherd, from there, leader. See, if you can't come down, God can't lift you up. If you're already born with a silver spoon in the palace, like Ambani's children, you will stay like that. God cannot lift you up, you're already here. Is it making sense to you? From palace, God has to bring him down. From there, God lifts him. Now, my friends, lessons, lessons also for us. Moses makes five excuses to God when God tells him to be a leader. Look, you know he has a st stammering problem. Moses had a problem with speech, stuttering. Interesting, the day before I was invited for a reading of a certain play, all conducted by principals. Very good. I was the only pastor there. 
I was truly humbled that they invited me. All educated principals, teachers of school. So I went, went down to St. James's. Fantastic job done by the principals, right? Interesting that people ask me for feedback after that. So I told so and so, I told the seven principal, your acting is excellent, but this is where you need to make an improvement. They took it well. You understand, humility. See, Moses, even after God is calling him to do this job, he has humility. Look at his excuses. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? First question, point number two, suppose I go to these people and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? You remember what God says, I am who I am. Third excuse, what if they will not believe me and listen? See, if God calls you and you and you for leadership in the church, what if no one will listen? God will deal with them. Fourth excuse, pardon me, Lord. I have never been eloquent. That means you had a problem with the speech. Neither in the past have you spoken. I am slow of speech and tongue. Moses says, take my brother. You remember his brother's name, Aaron. Aaron is better, take him. Again, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send me someone else. Send someone else. Now, some weeks ago, I was uh, speaking in this church in Hyderabad. Massive church. They have like six services, each service, 400 to 500 people. Various pastors spoke through the day. The next day, after a certain pastor had spoken that Sunday, on Monday I met them. He said, uh, I really enjoyed your sermon. Tell me how I can improve. Wow! Such humility, you know. I never expected that. Because you saw that I connected with the audience. You know, they were clapping, cheering, turning the scripture, reading. How can I improve it? Wait a minute. You've been there years. You never ask someone else that question. You ask me from outside. Mark of humility. See, what's your excuse if God calls you to do something? I'm not good enough. I can't speak. Wait a minute. God doesn't call you if you're good. He will qualify you once he calls you. Let's read on. So Moses had these issues. Anger, speech, fears, doubts. And may I ask you, do you also have these issues? If God calls you for leadership, wherever, I'm not saying to be a pastor, in your organization, in your church. God, I'm not good enough. I have these issues. Do you also say that? Look at his strengths. Humility. He could understand people. Heroism. Stepped into a situation when people were being bullied. Patience. Self-reflection. And he had charisma and wisdom. See, the point is, my friend, no matter how low he thought of himself, he had the humility to accept I'm not good enough. God used those weaknesses. If God calls you to another place to serve, don't make excuses. God will work out through your weaknesses. Moses was a very what? Humble man. More so than any other man on earth. You remember... Someone says in Exodus 2, Who made you ruler and judge? Are you thinking of killing me as you kill the Egyptian? Moses was scared. What did people find out? You remember, he killed someone. Someone said, you really think you'll get away? And no matter how many mistakes you made, my friend, if God calls you, he'll deal with your haters. If God has called you to bring peace where there is chaos, God will deal to those who break the peace. And there was a certain man who went to Lal Bazar and complained his whole mind peace was destroyed. Credit card was stolen three weeks ago. Credit card being stolen is a serious crime. No? Lal Bazar is very good. So Lal Bazar told him, see, three weeks back it was stolen. Why are you coming now? He said, see, the thief who stole it, I was monitoring his spending patterns. It was less than my wife. So I was okay. He was spending less than her. So I thought the credit card is in good hands. The police said, oh, very good. Why are you coming now after three weeks? Now what he said, I think now the thief's wife is using it. Ooh. People will do anything to destroy your peace, my friends. If God has called you, stop making excuses. So quickly, God moved him from prince to convict to shepherd to Israel's leader. See, God cannot lift you up unless you are down. 
he gave up his privileges in the palace, went down, stood up for others. May you also stand for others. If you see someone bullying someone, and this happens everywhere, especially Christians, notorious, he loved controlling, Allah controlling him, her. If you see someone being bullied, stand up, stand up for the bully, my friend. Two points I'll give and then I'll close. First, don't settle for substitutes. Now, God makes a very interesting statement. I will send an angel before you and drive out these people, Canaanites and words, whatever. Which means, God is saying, I won't come. I will send a substitute. Oh. Sometimes we settle for substitutes, no? So there's a king by the name of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was king. One fine day, the enemies came and robbed all the golden shields. Took them away. They were very smart. See, if as pastor, something gets stolen, first person I'll tell is Sam, Ria, the Dickens boat, right? Things got stolen, he never told anybody. He took the brass shields and polished and make it look like gold. <laughs> that, that is fraud, no? <laughs> Mischief. Sometimes we, we settle for substitutes. Substitutes are not good enough. For those of you who have Diet Coke, you don't want calories. It doesn't taste like the real thing, no? Diet Coke. Artificial sweeteners, those of you uh, diabetes. Still doesn't taste like sugar, no? See, what do you use as a substitute? The Israelites, instead of a relationship with God, substituted it for a relationship with idols. And that's when God got upset. Are you with me? So God says, see, I will keep my promise. I will remove my presence from you. So first, don't settle for substitutes. You remember Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, Samaritan woman? Five husbands. You are settling for second best. Five husbands, you think there's an issue. She is having waters that don't quench her thirst. Jesus says, if you drink this water I give you, you will never go thirsty. Friends, don't settle for thirst substitutes. Someone said, we are all born original. Please don't let's die copies. Don't be someone else. Point number two, take time out from the crowd. So first, don't settle for substitutes. Second, take time. Why am I saying this? Jesus always spent time away from the crowd. You remember? Who was the next leader after Moses? You remember? Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. When you go home, read. It's almost like a Bollywood movie. Damn, Moses is dead. Did you read that? Chapter 1 was to Moses is dead. Joshua, you take over. Why did God give Joshua leadership? Not good enough. Because Joshua was faithful in worshipping. See, if God can trust you in worship, I can trust you in leadership in all the battles that you fight. See, even as I close my friends, sometimes we fight too strong, too hard, too loud. The battle is not yours. The battle is God's. Learn to leave the fight in God's hands. We will never be good enough. If God calls you, He doesn't call you because you are good. He will qualify you once He calls you. Not to respond to that call. Bow with me as we pray. Father, we make so many excuses. Desperate circumstances. We switch from hope to hopelessness, from anger to patience to stillness. And we are so caught up in this that sometimes we find it hard to hear your voice. But Father, you are a God who makes a path in the wilderness. Despite my excuses, you use my weakness, you use my strength. And your word says, your strength is made perfect in weakness. Father, may you use all that I have today, even when I don't add up. May you use my weaknesses, may you use my strengths. Give me a vision for tomorrow that you want me to see. And may you lead through our wilderness. For may we say, this one thing I do, forgetting which is past and pushing forth forward to what lies ahead. Thank you, Father, for working in our lives, for choosing me even when I was not worthy. And I place all my weaknesses at your feet and ask that you will use it for your glory. 
Thank you for dealing with my guilt, my shame and breaking those bonds that make me a slave to them. Fill our hearts with rejoicing even as we leave this place. And when you have called us, may we learn to respond because you are calling. Because you have called me, you have a purpose and may you fulfill it. Father, you always call us out of our comfort zones. We are so comfortable where we are, but your calling brings us discomfort. Give us the courage to know. If you call us, you will equip us. If you call us, you will strengthen us. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Have a good week and stay blessed. God bless you.